I tell you what, I'll do a deal, okay? I'll stop making those stupid noises when I sit down and get up. Or I'll try and stop making those stupid noises. How does that sound? If when we get to, I don't know, a thousand subscribers, how does that sound? Good? Deal? Yeah? Okay, let's see what happens. Let's see what happens. Do you know what? I started running when lockdown first kicked in um, back in March. I've been running for most of the last 10 months actually every day and I've lost about a stone. I tell you what, if ever you need to lose weight, just start running. The weight falls off you, believe you me. Start running. I've lost about a stone and a half since I started running. Last night, my wife actually said to me, don't lose any more weight. You're starting to look a bit old and haggard. <laughs> Which is nice. Who needs enemies, eh, when your friends are like that? When you've got friends like that. Um, so, hands up, who needs to lose a little bit of weight? Oh my goodness, I sound like a teacher now. My wife's a teacher. You must be catching. Crazy crazy so in the last video we mentioned that hey isn't it good news about the um, vaccine very very good news it's all starting to kick in now we've had some big publicity on the first woman and the first man to have the vaccine um, even may <laughs> The first man to have a vaccine was called William Shakespeare from Warwickshire, can you believe? William Shakespeare even made Matt Hancock cry, didn't it? On Good Morning Britain in front of Piers and Susanna. Amazing. Who think If you believe they were real tears, I think they were probably real tears. I think he was overcome with emotion, but what do you all think? Your theatre people out there in the theatre sector, you can probably judge on make your own judgment, cast your own view on whether you think they were real or not. Perhaps Matt Hancock belongs to his local theatre company, I don't know. You can decide on that. So in the last but we're all getting the vaccine now, which is great. And in the last video, kind of linked to that, we said, um what were you doing? Can you remember what you were doing? when the first lockdown first kicked in because we were all supposed to remember what we were doing when Kennedy got shot, when Elvis died. Those are things we were all supposed to remember. Oh yeah, I remember that happening when Princess Diana died, you know, when we first heard about all these terrible bits of news. What were we doing? Um, and I can remember exactly what we were doing when the first lockdown kicked in. It was a Thursday, it was the 12th of March, and Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, yeah, it was a Thursday, definitely Thursday, the 12th of March, because Boris made his big announcement on the 16th of, we don't think you should go to the theatre at the moment, and of course, he didn't announce lockdown officially till the next Monday, which was the 23rd, but as far as theatre was concerned, it all kicked in on the Saturday, on the 16th. Monday the 16th, because um, people just stopped going to the theatres, productions closed up, the West End shows closed up, everyone cancelled their tickets, everyone just stopped going to theatre. And so on the Thursday, just four days earlier, we'd been invited to go to Guildford to see Educating Rita. We were invited to the matinee of Educating Rita. Um, it was Willie. It was the 40th anniversary tour of Willie Russell's amazing, amazing play, and we were invited to go to the matinee. And what an amazing play that was, um, and still is. Very, very popular with many, many amateur companies up and down the country. Educating Rita. We can all remember the film with Michael Caine and Judy Walters. Of course, she was starring in the theatre production of Educating Rita at the time. Michael Caine wasn't, he got drafted in to appear in the film, but like Audrey Hepburn actually was drafted into My Fair Lady to play Eliza Doolittle, famously snubbing Julie Andrews, who had um, 
been making a name for herself and making a very big thing for herself in My Fair Lady as Eliza do on the stage. But she wasn't selected. Hollywood, the powers that be, the wise people in Hollywood, you know, the way they decide who, how they're going to fill cinema bums on seats. And they decided Audrey Hepburn was a better bet to do that. So they gave it to Audrey Hepburn. Um, although she didn't sing the songs, as we all know, that was Marnie, wasn't it? Who sang the songs for My Fair Lady. But anyway, we digress. We will probably talk about that another time. But, um, yeah, Judy Walters, Michael Caine was in the film version, obviously, made a big star of Judy Walters, um, thanks to her brilliant portrayal as Rita. Anyway, the 40th anniversary stage tour of Educating Rita was starring Stephen Tompkins and Jessica Johnson as Frank and Rita. And we were invited to go to Guildford to the, see the matinee performance and then I'd interview them straight afterwards. And it was fascinating. I've never seen so many walking sticks in all my life. Um, I got a few bruises on my shins, I can tell you, that day. I really, really did. But um, it's it's also ironically fascinating how that audience represented the most vulnerable group of people as far as the pandemic goes that was soon to follow straight afterwards. All the pensioners, old age pensioners, senior citizens, I don't know what the correct term is. Would you... Is it, is it politically correct now to say pensioners or senior citizens? I don't know, but just take it from Red that I've used the correct, politically correct term, okay? I don't want to get into trouble and I don't want to use the incorrect term, so take it as Red that I've used the correct term. So we, in, we interviewed Stephen Tomkinson straight after that really, really good performance. And Jessica Johnson we spoke to as well. Stephen Tomkinson has had a really, really successful career, hasn't he? Um, in theatre and film and television. He's obviously starred in Brassed Off. Drop the Dead Donkey started out in on television. Brassed Off, DCI Banks. I missed him in Spam a lot, which was a great, great shame. He's done a lot of theatre, actually, which not many people know about. But he's... he's uh, and and if you if you are a digital subscriber or actually we bought that one out in print so you might have a print version of it but if you're a digital subscriber you can go on the website right now look at issue number 48 and you'll be able to read the interview with Stephen and Jessica that I did and catch up with it that way but I missed him in Spam a lot which was a great shame you play King Arthur and I've seen Spam a lot about nine or ten times now. It's one of my favourite, along with Our House, it's one of my favourite musicals, one of my favourite stage productions, stage musicals, whatever you want to call it, um, by Eric Idle and John Dupre. I've seen some really, really good productions, both professional and amateur. I saw a really good one at Erith Playhouse, actually, uh, an amateur production of Spam a lot. Really, really good production if you understand the kind of comedy and you get your head around and you've got a director that can get his head around what you're trying to achieve and the kind of comedy you're there to reproduce and you can understand Monty Python and Erica Idle and John Dupre and get inside their heads and what they meant then why can't you produce a brilliant production and I've seen some great ones I've in in the professional industry I've seen Joe Pasquale Simon Russell Beale, Ruth, Rufus Brigstock. I've seen I've even I've seen Phil Jupiter's play King Arthur. I've seen some great great King Arthur's, but I missed Stephen Tomkinson, which was a shame. Lady of the Lakes, I've seen Jodie Prenger, Hannah Waddingham, you name it, I've seen them. I've I've also seen um, Bonnie Langford play Lady of the Lake, probably the one of the best Lady of the Lakes I've seen, and she's tiny. But it's all about the experience you bring to the role, isn't it? And she had a great stage presence, Bonnie Langford. She's so experienced. She can bring... She can really bring it... Oh, so sorry, in 42nd Street, actually. Um, the the revival. Um, yeah, fantastic. So, yeah. Um, 
fan fantastic. Um, in fact, Bonnie Langford was on our um, cover as the Lady of the Lake, and she talked about spam a lot in that in in that cover story interview. So that be, might be another one. Look for the if you're a subscriber, look for the cover with Bonnie Langford on the front, and you'll see her in. And I'll tell you what else I was going to talk about when we met Gary Barlow, Gary Barlow, and Tim Firth when they did the Calendar Girls musical. It was called The Girls back then, not Calendar Girls the musical as it is known as now, which kind of makes more sense in a theatrical producing and licensing setting. Tim Firth wrote this screenplay he adapted it for the stage he adapted it for the musical theater uh, the musical with gary barlow they wrote about 80 songs or something they've been childhood friends they grew up in the same town uh, same village they grew up in and they they were young friends from a young age they wrote about 80 songs for the musical and whittled it down to the final 14 or or 20 songs whatever it is in the musical and um so there's some really good songs in there and we went along on that press launch you can imagine how busy it was you mentioned Gary Barlow and the whole world descends upon it so every, the BBC with their filming stuff I think for the news bulletins or the one show or whoever it was and all the big new nationals were there and we were there and a lot of other theatre magazines were there, theatre newspapers the stage was there you, you name it, they were all there um, wanting to speak to Gary and Tim, of course, take their pictures. And what a great cast it was. We had um, we had Sophie Louise Dan in the cast. We had Michelle Dotrice, um, who was Frank Spencer's original wife, Betty. It, it, those that were mentioned television, but she's done a lot of theatre, of course. And we also had Joanna Riding in the cast, Claire Moore. Very, very star-studded cast, an experienced cast. And lovely people to talk to as well. You know, they're all the normal people. They're, he, Gary Barlow's a normal person and Tim Firth. And, you, you know, you can read that. Look for the cover with Gary Barlow and Tim Firth on the front. It's number 33, I believe. Um, so, so there you go. Look for it. Um, have a, you can read it now, read the cover story, download the PDF, read the cover story there and um, catch up with our visit to the girls musical. Uh, I don't think Samuel French will ever repeat that exercise when they broke all box office, all licensing records when they issued and with Tim Firth they issued an 18 month window for amateur theatre companies a few years ago to license Calendar Girls. This was the before the musical was even a glint in Tim Firth's eye. Um, the stage play Calendar Girls musical was released to the amateur theatre sector. And I believe Samuel French issued something in the region of 600 amateur licenses, which was incredible. And incre they broke all their records and everyone it seemed was producing calendar girls and a lot of money some of the licensing money went straight to bloodwise the charity and on top of that a lot of amateur companies um, brought in their own independent charity fundraising initiatives that they raised thousands of pounds for for bloodwise and and charities as you know the you know calendar girls was based on the original calendar which they hoped would sell a few hundred copies to make their money back to buy a sofa for the, oh my goodness, to buy a sofa for the hospital. Amazing, amazing work they've done, the original Calendar Girls. And, well, the original Calendar Girls were also at that press launch, by the way, with Gary Barlow and Tim Firth. And um, we'll, put, we'll throw a few photos up and you'll be able to see. But it's all in the article as well. So do have a read if you can, have a catch-up um, there. Uh, we will. We haven't got time today, but we will talk about my son as a drag queen. Got some big news coming up. Can't talk about that now, but I will cover it. I'll also talk about a thing I thought about last night. Actually, just like all this is unplanned, by the way. Everything is just off the top of my head as I think of it. I talk to the camera, and that's it. Nothing's been written. No bullet points written that I'm trying to make sure I cover. 
none of that going on anymore. Um, it's just as I, as I think of it, it comes to you. And I thought of something last night in bed about being untrained and, and amateur theatre and how amateur theatre is is full of people that are not necessarily trained but are still highly, highly, naturally talented people. And that's actually how we started Sardines. But I'll, I'll talk about that in, the, in another video with time to come. And there's some other things I've thought about as well. So um, we'll, <laughs> we'll cover that in, a, in, um, in another time and another time. But for now, stay safe, stay well. We will be back because there's a vaccine in the air and we're all going to get the vaccine. We'll all be at the theatre again soon. 2021 is going to be a great year. It wasn't 2020 awful. It'd be nice to get it over and out of the way. I know there are some theatre companies around, some amateur theatre companies around the, I got in trouble since the last video when I said amateur theatre has thrown in the towel on 2020. There are some companies that have, throughout the pandemic, they've either recorded stuff or they've put stuff together. Many, many companies, amateur companies all up and down the country that have got videos in the archives now that they've, lockdown videos, monologues, whatever you want to call it, They've put stuff together, they've been rehearsing in Zoom, some that are allowed to are doing live streams, some are even doing performances in front of a socially distanced audience at Christmas if their tier allows for it. And there we go. So yeah, there there is some live streaming, some some YouTube releases going on, there's even some actual productions that are going on. And let's hope that we don't go into Tier 3. Let's hope London doesn't go into Tier 3. Um, it's quite possible, because lots of London boroughs, the infection, two-thirds of London boroughs have seen a, a very small rise in infection rates, but not a decrease. So it means that London has every possibility on the 16th when the government introduces a revision to their tier system and who's in what tier... There's every possibility that London could be put into Tier 3, and if that's the case, all bets are off. Every production, theatre production, whether you're professional or amateur, gets shelved. No live theatre will go on, so kudos. I'm sure at watching all the news bulletins at the moment, because um, if London gets put into Tier 3 on the 16th, their play at the their pantomime production at the Palladium will be off. Everything London wise, London based will be off. So fingers crossed it doesn't happen and um we don't all have to adhere to very, very close to lockdown rules in in London for tier three coming up. But anyway, there we go. Um there's a vaccine on the way. Stay safe, stay safe, stay well. We will be back. Next year's the year to do it. Speak to you soon. Bye for now. <laughs> <laughs>